My name is Jennifer Eddy and I'm the Executive Director of the Family Resource Center here in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. I've invited a dear friend to join the discussion. Marvin, can you say hi? Hi, my name is Marvin Lynn. I'm a good friend of Jennifer's, but I'm also uh, the Dean and a professor at the College of Education in Portland State University. So thank you, Dr. Lynn, for helping me out. Um, we want to help parents, all parents, talk to their children about race, whatever the skin color of the parent or the child. Um, and this is important so that kids can stay safe and make sense of their world and feel secure. I'd like to start by saying I am not an expert and this is a complicated topic, so I probably won't get everything right just as we as parents don't always get everything right. And that's okay. Um, we just have to be willing to try. In this presentation, I'd like to start by covering some general principles and talking to kids about challenging topics and then invite Marvin to share his thoughts, including how best to empower and protect young black and brown children and any other words of wisdom he cares to share and end with some resources that you as parents might found, find helpful. Actually, one resource I'll share right now, and that is to encourage everyone to tune in this Saturday morning at 10 a.m. to CNN, June 6th. Um, Big Bird will be starring in a show called Coming Together, Standing Up Against Racism. So at first, some general principles. When talking to kids, it's helpful to stay calm. That helps them um, process more of what you're saying. The next general princess principle is to be honest, but spare all the details. So if I'm talking to a young child about the coronavirus, I could say it is a disease that kills people, but if we take care to protect ourselves, we're likely gonna be okay. So stay calm, be honest, not too detailed and reassuring. And next, invite their questions. So for our coronavirus example, they might say, what does the virus look like? Or will it kill grandma? And then lastly, you wanna find some way to help them be active. So we'd say for coronavirus, come, let's make sure to wash our hands in order to protect grandma. Or do you want to make a mask to keep your dolls safe? Imaginative play is super helpful for kids to process challenging information. What your child learns when he hears you handle things in this way is that whatever is going on seems manageable because you're pretty calm. They learn accurate information about an important problem, but bit by bit without feeling overwhelmed and they learn that they can be part of the solution, which helps them feel good about themselves and decreases worry. So for instance, if I'm asking my four-year-old, if I'm talking to my four-year-old son about the George Floyd situation, I might start with this mural of his face and ask, do you see this painting? It makes me feel sad. It's a picture of George Floyd a man who was killed in Minneapolis. Have you seen his face before? Many people have seen his face, not just here in Minneapolis, but all over the country. And in fact, the world, it's not right that he was killed. And then I might be quiet and see how he responds. Notice I'm not starting by sharing who did this, in what manner, or why, all of which have pretty upsetting answers. I'm starting by sharing the image of a nice man and the idea that something important happened that everyone is talking about and that it's not right. Gradually, over time, and in response to his questions, I'll share more information to fill in why the whole world is concerned right now about what happened to George Floyd and why I'm upset. 
as kids get older, they may be exposed to images on the news or ideas that are troubling before you even realize it. Um, for this, I would start by asking what they know about the situation and make sure they have correct information and then address their concerns. The idea is that together, at whatever speed we need to go at, and the younger the child, the more slowly we need to go, we'll eventually reach the disturbing realization that although the police are here to protect us, and mostly do, in this case, the policemen involved did not protect George Floyd, but instead killed him. But it's important not to leave the discussion there. You don't want kids feeling hopeless or bad. Instead, you kind of want to turn it to the positive. So I might then show pictures of Martin Luther King and talk about him and Oprah Winfrey and others to show people have been working hard to improve the situation and there are respected Black people who've done great things and have triumphed in this country. And then I'd start looking for things for them to do actively to work against the distressing situation. Maybe let's draw a picture to send to George Floyd's family, or we could collect food and supplies to send to our friends in Minneapolis. Although this is a very disturbing story, we are not without hope and we can be the heroes. Marvin, I'd like to invite you in now to share some of your thoughts. I know you're a father of three wonderful young uh, African-American children, and I'm thinking that the conversation that you have with them might be slightly different. Yes, I, I think that you shared a lot of ideas that are things that I certainly uh, would have incorporated and have incorporated in the past um, with my children. You know, of course, the situation involving George Floyd is not new. I think what I have tried to do um, is be more of an answerer of questions um, to allow them the freedom to ask questions about what's going on and to try to respond um, to their questions and their issues. Uh, we have tried to use literature as a way to um, bring some ideas forward. Uh, so I think with, with, the, with what happened to George Floyd, what you rightly emphasized was um, the notion of race and how race plays a role in this. Um, and that race is uh, something that, we, that makes us different but uh, should be valued and respected at that, uh, but, uh, and that sometimes it's used um, in other ways. And so in the, in the instance of George Floyd, um, I think we would find a way to talk about racial difference um, as something to be valued, but also as something that unfortunately gets used uh, in other ways and that it, that it can lead to and has led to um, loss of life for many people, particularly black men. Uh, quite frankly, with African-American male children, you have to have the conversation about safety and about how they move in the world and about um, how they are to respond when or if they are confronted by the police. Um, and you have to have the conversation about the steps that they would take um, and what their rights are. And, um, and, you know, again, you're talking about young children, but there are instances of young children being accosted, arrested by police and mistreated. And so unfortunately you have to have these conversations pretty early. Although um, these are things I can talk about more easily now with my boys than I, than I probably could at the age of four. Unfortunately, I think for African-American parents who have African-American children, a lot of our effort is on um, trying to ensure that our children avoid negative interactions with the police. Uh, at the same time, talking with them about race and about what's happening in a way that, that uh, doesn't cause them to lose hope and to be completely scared out of their mind. Could I ask you a question? When we were talking about police, um, I was talking with a friend who said, it's true what happened to George Floyd is a travesty. And like you said, it's not new. 
On the other hand, for young children, you don't want them to be scared of the police. That's something that we work with young kids to know that the police are here to protect you. I guess I'm wondering, it's a little more of a fraught relationship in African-American families. How do you talk about the police? Yeah, you know, unfortunately for African-Americans, um, there is um, a fear um, of, of the police. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not something that um, is good. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I do think we teach our children to have, I guess I would call it um, a healthy fear, you know, um, which means, yes, you absolutely should respect authority. Um, you should know what you should and should not say when, when interacting with the police. Um, I wouldn't say that my children are fearful of the police, but I think they understand how things can go pretty quickly if something is misinterpreted. Thank you for that, for sharing that. And uh, I think it's important for us all to be thinking about that. And I was thinking that in terms of at what age is it appropriate to start this conversation? So I'm imagining talking to my son when he was four years old about this. And I can see a number of maybe white parents thinking, well, that's awfully young to have the conversation. And on the other hand, parents of African-American children thinking, well, you've got, like you said, you have to start early because they need to know how to keep themselves safe in the world. So there's a little bit of a, uh, a double standard almost there. Yeah, yeah, four is really young. And, and you know, there's certain things I probably wouldn't talk about, but I would want my four-year-old son, and I think my four-year-old my boys when they were four did understand this, that uh, one has to be cautious, one has to be careful, you know, and that you don't necessarily enjoy the same freedoms in that area that other people might. And, um, and, and how, you know, the, the way that one communicates that to a four-year-old is probably different than you'd communicate it to a 13-year-old, but nevertheless, you do try to try to get that message across. Um, and I don't know that they understand it completely. I really appreciate your sharing this. And I guess before we um, conclude this part of this uh, presentation, I wonder if you could speak to, um, and uh, forgive me if this feels too intrusive, but just the, I mean, I am crying and sad at the loss of life and the callousness and the unfairness of this situation. And I would imagine that many African-American people in this country are also Kind of traumatized. I did not watch the video and I just thought I, I've heard what's in the video. I know what it is, but it's just too disturbing for me to watch. Um, can you speak to how you handle the trauma of these repeated reports and how you help your kids process that? They have watched the video um, and I don't, I don't believe that they've watched it, you know, more than once. Um, I think what I have tried to do is just be available for questions and for conversation. Uh, they've had a lot of reactions, uh, most, most of which has been anger. Um, and I think that's what the majority of us feel is we're just, we're just angry about it. Um, and in a lot of ways, the kind of national reaction, you know, this whole period of unrest that we're in, um, it helps uh, in some ways because you, you, you don't feel like people, it feels like people care, and and that um, hopefully we're moving toward a resolution. You know that these officers will be convicted, and and so all of that helps in the in the grief process. Um, and it and so as we see the progress of the of the unrest as well as the progress of the legal case um, against these officers, um, it, it it helps us to feel a little bit like okay, well perhaps. Um, this is not something that will continue to happen in a way that, um, you know, leaves these, the killers with, um, with impunity. Well, thank you so much. That was very helpful. Um, and I just want to say you have also been such a great role model and mentor to my own son, which is really a gift to him and to our whole family. So thank you for that and for volunteering to participate in today's conversation and all you do to make this world a better place. Thank you. Thank you.
I'd like to end with just a few resources for families. I mentioned that tomorrow, um, Saturday at 10 a.m., CNN is hosting an interactive discussion of racism and racial violence uh, led by Sesame Street's Big Bird. And I encourage parents and kids together to tune in. I will certainly, it will get that conversation going. Another important resource is children's books. Uh, reading aloud to children is so good for them. And whatever their skin color or yours, it's great to expose children to a variety of different characters and books. Um, so Latino, Korean, Native American, the more different kinds of people that they can identify with in stories, the better for us all. I would encourage you not to talk about race explicitly when you read these stories, but just enjoy them for what they are. Some of my favorites are Hair Love by Matthew Cherry, about a tender African-American dad working hard to figure out how to style his daughter's untamable hair. There she is. Um, another good one is Sulwe by uh, Lupito Nyong'o. Um, uh, and that's a story of a little girl who, like Lupita herself, learns to love and accept her very dark skin, even though some people sometimes reject her for it. The Family Resource Center has both of these titles for families to sign out for free. And I'll also attach a list of resources for children's books for you to look up in your local library. So I just want to end by saying thanks again to Marvin. Good luck to you for parents. It's a hard conversation knowing how to talk about race with young children. And just to remember, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be willing to try.